Hi, this is Dr. David Chia. I'm an eye physician and surgeon in Irvine, California, and I'm here to teach you about what you can do to help protect your eyes. We all take our eyes for granted. Due to improvements in technology, the amount of information that we have to process has increased exponentially over time. Texts, alerts, emails, videos, streaming services, news and social media feeds, just to name a few. Therefore, our screen time has exploded. Our eyes are special and caring for them, like anything regarding good health, takes effort. But having healthy eyes and sight is one of the keys to living well. We all know that taking care of your eyes is important, but many of us don't know how. This video presentation is part of the instruction manual that your eyes should have come with. But in order to know how to protect them, we also need to understand how do they work. So that this video presentation is really split into a couple different parts. The first part is helping us understand when you can't focus or things are blurry, why that is. The second part, we'll be talking about different diseases of the eye and perhaps the brain. And that's talking about what might be wrong with the visual system. That will be reserved for a second part uh, of the video presentation to understanding how to protect your eyes. So to understand the eye and how it works, we understand that light rays enter the eye through the clear cornea, pupil, and lens. These light rays are focused directly onto the retina, the light sensitive tissue lining the back of the eye. The retina then converts light rays into impulses. These are sent through the optic nerve to your brain where they are recognized as images. Understand that 70% of the eye's focusing power comes from the cornea. Now the inability to see clearly is often caused by refractive error. If there is no refractive error, then the eye is considered emetropic. Okay. However, it's very common to get refractive error, and the four different reasons for that would be myopia, also known as nearsightedness, hyperopia, also known as farsightedness, astigmatism, as well as presbyopia. We'll go over each one of these in a little bit more detail. Now, hyperopia is really the state of the eye when you're first born, and that's farsightedness. So in this case, the distance between the cornea and the retina may be too short. So light rays are focused behind the retina instead of on it. So in this case, in adults, but not children, distance objects will look clear, but close objects will appear blurred. Mild hyperopia is normal early in life since the eye is short and not fully grown. So again, this is the default way that we all are when we're actually first born. The eye is small and short. And that makes sense. Babies are small and short, and therefore the eye is small and short. So we can see here on the lower right-hand side the simulation of what hyperopia would look like, particularly for adults. Now, because children have very flexible lenses, this is not a problem. Hyperopia in children is absolutely normal. Okay. The problem comes in myopia or also known as a nearsightedness, when the distance between the cornea and the retina may be too long. Light rays focus in front of the retina instead of on it. Close objects will look clear, but distance objects will be appear blurred. So in this case, we see the simulation where the girl in the foreground of the picture on the bottom right is clear, whereas the far images of the rocks and the trees, etc., are actually blurry. And this is a simulation of what nearsightedness is. In the picture above that, we can see how the blue focused light rays are falling short of the retina. Uh, in other words, they fall in front of the retina. So myopia or nearsightedness is the most common cause for impaired vision under the age of 40. And the global prevalence of myopia has grown by 66% in the past three decades, and has been estimated that nearly half of the world's population will be myopic by the year 2050. And so we can see that based on the graphic here, the real increase in terms of myopia. And so just looking at that very simply, worldwide in the year 2000, approximately 25% of the population was myopic. And again, by 2050, that's estimated to have increased by 50%. 
In East Asia, it's even more alarming. If you consider that in the year 1955, that only 10 to 20 percent of that population was myopic, whereas in 2015, 90 percent of teenagers are actually myopic. Another sub-analysis in Taiwan looked at the prevalence of myopia in six to seven year olds being approximately 20 to 30 percent, and again by high school, that has increased to 84 percent. So in general, it's estimated that the myopia, if it is going to get worse, increases by approximately one diopter per year until the end of adolescence. And that's just a general rule. Now, some of the causes of myopia. Genetics, certainly having parents with nearsightedness increases the risk of myopia. But we now think that a large part of this environmental, that how you use your eyes influences how they develop. And that makes a lot of sense. But we do think that children are the most vulnerable to the development of myopia, that a lack of natural light or sunlight is involved, as well as excessive near work, such as reading and homework and use of the computer, as well as all of this increased screen time. And that's really changed the eyes from the normal development of the eye to nearsightedness. Now on the right hand side we can really see this is a nice infographic uh, from Nature published in 2015 and it really says that East Asian countries have seen a steep rise in the short-sightedness or nearsightedness over the past 50 years. The condition is caused by the slight elongation of the eyeball meaning that light is focused in front of the retina instead of on it and we can see that illustrated in the top but I think it's very interesting if you look at the bottom one there these are the estimated prevalence of myopia or nearsightedness in 20 year olds in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, South Korea and we see it's a linear increase so you know we've been blaming screens for so long but when you really study that and you understand that linear increase then this actually really speaks to the primary cause, which is urbanization, schooling, and the lack of sunlight in childhood. And so when someone is in there growing up, a child, but perhaps even teens and 20s, it's really important to get that natural light. And we'll go over that in a little more depth over the next couple of slides, because this information is still relatively recent in terms of our understanding. So you can see how recent these discoveries have been and just the recent alarm bells have been sounded there. Here's a very sweet irony. You can see that this is the cover of the January 2020 American Academy of Ophthalmology INET. And so it of course reads, a growing pandemic, what to do about myopia. Now of course we all know that the year 2020, the pandemic that is currently known is not about myopia. However, the coronavirus pandemic will certainly influence this myopia pandemic as well. And so we have to understand these implications and also how further to protect our site given these new risks. And especially with all the mandatory stay at home, safer at home orders. So in that article in the January 2020 INET, it talks about these three myopia control solutions. It says one, solution one, go outside. Solution two, bring light indoors. Solution three, curtail near work. Let's go over each one of those in a little bit more depth. So in terms of going outside, we think that the minimum would be going outside about two hours a day. Now there's still some question in terms of, is it okay whether or not it's direct sunlight or indirect sunlight, whether the shade is okay, uh, et cetera. We'll go over some of the science based on that. Uh, we do think that using sunglasses and a hat is okay. We want to try to use natural light uh, whenever possible if you are indoors. And then we certainly know that monitoring and controlling screen time is important. So this is the best way that we have right now of understanding how to take care of your eyes. And this is actually every single minute of every single day. So on the right, this is actually a public service uh, safety message from Singapore and it says keep myopia away go outdoors and play our eyes are precious we must take good care of them 
and it suggests that we should be spending more time on ball games, walks, fun to the playground, and other outdoor activities every day, and less time on computer games, handheld games, handphone games. And this is something that we've just only recently, recently understood is actually very important. So this is an interesting article. This was published in August 2018 in the so-called Blue Journal of Ophthalmology. And it's the Myopia Prevention and Outdoor Light Intensity in a School-Based Cluster Randomized Trial, also known as the Recess Outside Classroom Trial 711. So the reason why they called it that is that it was done as a school-based program in Taiwan. And this was looking at first graders. And they looked at the effect of what having 11 hours per week outside would mean in terms of the influence on the myopic progression. So in addition to that, both groups had break from near work, about 10 minutes for every 30 minutes. That was also included uh, in the intervention group. Now this involved almost 700 first graders across 16 schools. And so you can see it was 267 kids in that intervention group and 426 kids in the control group. And that alone, these interventions, meant that there was a 54% lower risk of rapid myopia. In addition, they felt that exposure to 1000 lux or more of light was actually important. So we can see some of the examples of the kids on the lower left hand side. You can see some of the examples and in intensity readings from the recorders. It also kind of showed what those light sensors actually look like. And they also provided some mind plots from the intensity readings kind of over the course of the day. But you'll notice some very big spikes. Um, and that is very typical. Now, if we look at the next, now this slide actually shows some of the examples of the light intensity measurements across a number of different situations. And you'll notice that a thousand lux is really available anywhere except for inside the classroom. Notice the interesting juxtaposition of the sunlight being over 100,000 lux on the field presumably about midday versus inside the classroom having only 340 lux. And that obviously is orders of magnitude greater light intensity. So even with the window open to sunlight, that just one row away from the window makes a big difference in terms of light intensity that the eye is actually receiving. Now, another way that people have thought to bring light inside is actually structuring a classroom to basically introduce that. This particular slide shows the design of an experimental classroom in China where they actually made it made of glass. And we can really see it's a mostly glass kind of structure there. Uh, the rooftop is actually also kind of an opaque glass and that introduces the increase in terms of light intensity. And so, this was really highlighted as, as a way to introduce more light while the kids are in the classroom during the day. However, another less expensive way certainly to do this would be to increase the amount of breaks such as PE time, snack time, lunch time, etc., and perhaps really discouraging kids from being in the classroom unless absolutely necessary. As far as curtailing near work, our current understanding now is really that the best antidote for screen time is sunlight. And so we see it's really any type of screen time, but that also includes things like reading and close-up work and so forth there. Now we're not sure if it's really the intensity of light or just having the eyes converge at one uh, area. We think that both are important. And so these understandings have really changed the paradigm and our understanding of that. If we really are thinking of that two hours as something that is really a minimum requirement and as something that you need to do every day, such as just as important to our health as water, food, sleep, exercise, and it's so really important to try to get every day. Perhaps, of course, you're not able to do so, but that you have to make up for that perhaps on other days. And so that two hour minimum is really a good. We do know that having 
a high degree of nearsightedness is not just inconvenient having to wear glasses or contacts for visual correction, but that that itself increases the risk of eye diseases. So some things such as cataracts, which you can fix, but also some things like glaucoma, retinal detachments, choroidal neovascularization, macular degeneration, and even possibly blindness. And so that's really, I think, important understanding is that maybe all that screen time is not just bad, it actually might blind us too. There's a small but remote chance that that could increase our risk of blindness as well. Now, if somebody is already in this category of being over six diopters of myopia uh, or highly nearsighted, then regularly screening for eye disease becomes even more critical because we see that increased risk of all those six things would need to really be surveyed uh, at least annually by your eye care professional. Now going away from myopia and nearsightedness for a minute, finishing out the other refractive errors, understanding that what is astigmatism? Astigmatism is when the cornea is curved unevenly shaped more like a football than a basketball. So therefore, light passing through the uneven cornea is not properly focused on the retina. So that distance and close vision may appear blurry. Now, a good way to actually simulate that is actually if you look at the back of a spoon, that actually simulates what things look like with astigmatism. So we also know that the shape of most people's cornea, it tends to be hereditary. Uh, there is a certain amount that is not, and it could be uh, as a result of disease, but most of the astigmatism is a result of that corneal astigmatism, and that when light passes through it, there is going to be uneven. And these are some of the examples. Now with presbyopia, this is a normal condition in which the eyes gradually lose the ability to see things up close. When we're young, the lenses of our eyes are flexible and are able to change focus easily between near and far objects. Approximately around age 40, this is going to vary, of course, between people, this flexibility gradually begins to decrease, making it more difficult to see objects up close. And therefore, what many people do will be wear reading glasses if they did not read, wear reading glasses before. Now, people who are nearsighted or myopic they can see close just fine. So oftentimes you'll actually see them take their glasses off, perhaps put them on their head or put them down and read with their unaided eye or uncorrected eye. So some ways of correcting refractive errors. Certainly eyeglasses are the most common method of correcting refractive errors. They help to refocus light rays on the retina. Another way, of course, is to wear contact lenses. So these float on the tear film and coat the cornea. They refocus those ret rays onto the retina. So both eyeglasses and contact lenses are the most common ways to correct So now that we understand some of those ways in which to correct refractive error, what things can be used to help to control myopia? Because we just said that myopia is really increasing in prevalence and it's not just an inconvenience, it might have health implications. So these are some of the things that have been investigated at the present time. So now low dose atropine eye drops, this is a form of dilating eye drop that has been investigated in some of the Asian countries. Currently, they're not FDA approved, and we're not sure what the overall long-term side effects are from a pharmacological intervention. Uh, in other words, using eye drops to help slow down the rate of myopia. There's also some research into understanding of bifocals or progressive glasses, whether or not that will work. The studies are really mixed in terms of understanding uh, whether or not that helps for myopia progression. The two that are actually reasonably good, uh, one of them is the soft contacts dual focus lens. Um, as of late 2019, we had approval of Cooper Vision's MySight One Day soft contact lens. These are radio refractive gradient lenses or dual focus lenses that actually help to reduce the rate of nearsightedness and are at least 50% effective for reducing the rate of myopia. In addition to that, we also have a rigid gas permeal or hard contact lens that has been available for uh, 20 years or more. And so 
the daytime rigid gas permeable lenses have maybe some effect, but the more studied and well-known is orthokeratology that we'll go over in another slide. So now the mechanism by which we think that it prevents myopia is that it requires a certain amount of what we call peripheral myopia. So amitropization or the proper development of the eye requires that that focused light actually doesn't quite hit the retina in the periphery. So now let's go back to orthokeratology. So this is that rigid gas permeable contact lens. It is also known by the as a dream lens um, or by Paragon Vision Sciences Corneal Refractive Therapy. That is one company's proprietary rigid gas permeable contact lens that is also known by its name as CRT. So the way that the ortho-K lens works in general is that it reshapes the eyes at night. So these are placed onto the eye prior to the patient going to sleep. It flattens that central cornea, as you can see. And then we think that that long-term wear may reduce risk of myopic progression by as much as 43%, and perhaps even more than that. However, wearing a contact lens at night does increase the risk of infection. And we know that wearing any kind of contact lens at night increases the risk of an eye infection or microbial keratitis by more than 20 times compared to a daytime contact lens. We also know too is, is that the orthokeratology lens works best in the patients with minimal or no astigmatism, as well as a refractive error that is less than four diopters of a myopia. Going to the soft contact lens, the CooperVision Bright Futures Myopia Management Program with the MySight One Day, that's a mouthful, but it's the first and only contact lens FDA approved to slow the progression of myopia in children eight to 12 years of age at the initiation of treatment. So this was approved in late 2019, but was only launched in May of 2020. Now, some of the outcomes, they did a three-year study that was extended to seven, and they actually demonstrated that there was a 59% average reduction in myopia. So that is the spherical equivalent refractive error, or SERE. -E. It also showed that there was a 52% average reduction in axial lengthening, and that nine out of the 10 children self-reported when they were wearing the lenses to be seeing well. So that was their subjective feeling. How did they feel that their vision was while they're wearing these so-called dual zone contact lenses there? And most of the children, nine out of 10, really reported that they saw very well uh, reading screens, having to do homework, doing sports, etc. So this is a soft or hydrophilic contact lens for daily wear. Here, we also think that the ideal candidate, similar to the orthokeratology lens would be about minus 0.75 to minus four diopters of a stick, uh, uh, I'm sorry, of myopia with less than 0.75 diopters of astigmatism. On the right hand side, we can see that this is the effect of the dual zone contact lens where the myopic defocus is provided to the peripheral retina. We also can see the parameters of this particular soft contact lens. So this was based off of the ProClear one day contact lens that is by Cooper Vision and has 60% water content. Uh, it is approved to go up to minus six diopters of spherical power and that this is intended as a daily disposable contact lens. Beyond glasses and contacts, there is the role of corneal refractive surgery. This is a surgical procedure that alters the shape of the cornea to refocus light rays to help improve vision. And so we can really see the three currently generations of laser vision correction that are currently available. So going from the left-hand side, which is surface ablation surgery, the second generation, which is LASIK, which is the most commonly thought of laser vision correction, it does involve creating a flap as well as the eczema laser to perform the ablation. And then you have the most recent third generation, SMILE, also known as small manual incision lenticular extraction. 
and this is a minimally invasive flapless surgery, but in effect is still trying to reshape that cornea. So all of these are surgical interventions, and so really anyone under the age of 18 is really disqualified from having any of these procedures at the current time. There are also lens-based refractive surgery options, which I haven't gone over here in that slide there, but these surgical options may include things like phacic intraocular lenses and perhaps refractive lens exchange. That would be even more invasive though, as opposed to the cornea and reshaping the cornea. This is actually a in the eye surgery that is inducing a permanent change to the eye. So after having reviewed all these different refractive errors, we can also understand that there's a fairly big paradigm shift in our understanding of how to protect our sight. We now know that environment, not genetics, is the primary risk factor for myopia, and that not getting enough sunlight every day may actually cause myopia. Now we know that amount of sunlight is at least two hours. And so if you're not able to get it on one day, perhaps we need to make that up on another day. And so this is really critical that not taking care of our eyes is a choice, just like not brushing our teeth that inaction can cause injury, and that sunlight is just as important as water, food, sleep, and exercise in terms of the implications of health for our eyes. So we really need to change our priorities. We need to make our eyes really important. We need to protect our sight and our kids' sight. So, there's a nice quote that I'm very fond of that is credited to Neil Postman uh, that is often quoted by the late representative Elijah Cummings of Maryland. And he said that children are the messengers to a future that we will never see. But the question is, what if the children can't see? And it's because we really know now that how hard it is to help their eyes seeing if they need to keep getting a certain amount of sunlight every day. So this concludes part one of this presentation. My hope is that understanding refractive error and understanding the vision correction options will greatly help you, but also understanding that the onus to prevent it, certainly myopia from getting worse is in our hands and that that sunlight is the best antidote for all this screen time and that we're only going to get better if we all know and do better, and that's across everything. I certainly hope that this video has helped you know better and that it will enable you to also do better. Thank you for your time.